practicing intern and talked with D.C. Police Chief Charles Ramsey and with two reporters who've been covering the story, Tom Squatteri of USA Today and Michael Doyle of the Modesto Bee. Gloria Borgia will be here, and I'll have a final word on role models. But first, Condoleezza Rice on Face the Nation. Face the Nation with Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer. And now from CBS News in Washington, Bob Schieffer. Good morning again, and we uh, welcome now the uh, National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice, her first appearance on Face the Nation. Uh, Ms. Rice, let's uh, start right with it. Uh, you are just back from Moscow. Uh, Secretary of State Powell has been in China. Do you feel you have made any headway in convincing either of the leaders of these two countries about uh, America's uh, case for building a, an anti-missile defense system? I think we are making progress, particularly with the Russians, who are, after all, our partners in the AVM Treaty. And uh, we've made the case to the Russians that it's time to move beyond that treaty to something that's more appropriate to the post-Cold War era. And missile defense is a part of a larger framework that the president is presenting with lower offensive numbers, with uh, non-proliferation efforts. And we're going to begin now on a very intensive set of discussions with the Russians about how to get this done. I think we're quite a long way from where we were in January. If you look at the statement that President Putin and President Bush put out, out of Genoa, it clearly talked about a framework in which we would talk about both offense and defense. That's a step forward. With China, it's very clear that we uh, do need to intensify our consultations with the Chinese, uh, largely because of the EP3 incident. At about the time that we were going out for broader consultations, we didn't engage the Chinese at the level that we would like would have liked to have. So I think we will begin to do that you, now. When you say the EP3, you mean the spy plane. That's right. That's yes, right. Uh, yes. Let me ask you this. You say that, that you plan to replace the anti-ballistic missile treaty. What will we do? Will we formally withdraw from the treaty? And what will you put in its place? Well, we're open as to form right now. We do know that we need to do something else. This treaty is very restrictive. We cannot test properly under the constraints of this treaty. And we really do believe that it is the wrong basis for a cooperative U.S.-Russian relationship since it was a treaty based on the hostility of the Soviet Union and the United States. But we're open as to form. Uh, we will talk with our allies. We will talk with the Congress. We will talk with the Russians about how to do this. Let me just ask one other question because I want to clear up something. One of the things uh, that you said after you, during your news conference after your meeting with President Putin. You said uh, we are not prepared now to get involved in, quote, the kind of tortured arms control talks that occurred in the past over numbers of strategic weapons. Are you saying now that the numbers of weapons in the arsenals uh, it, it no longer matter? Not at all. The president has made clear, President Bush, that he wants to reduce the number of American offensive arms. And President Putin has said that he wants to reduce Russian arms. But what we don't need is to count every warhead and to try to match our arsenals exactly. We don't need to cross every T and dot every I in the way that we did in, in negotiations that took 11, 12 years. It's a different era. We can have different kinds of discussions about this. Well, can I just ask you why? Because we are not locked now in a relationship in which the only thing that we and the Soviet Union had in common was to keep from annihilating one another. This is a different relationship with Russia. The process by which we get to security forces that do, in fact, secure us ought to be a different process. Yeah, but so you say you're open to form on this. Tell us, if you got your wish, what form would it be then if you're not counting every missile okay well i think that we really believe that the united states and russia ought to talk uh, in talk together about what we each believe is necessary to secure us we may not need to have exactly the same number of offensive warheads we may not have exactly the same profile of what kinds of missile defenses we may wish to uh, may wish to deploy the the arms control treaties of the 1970s and 1980s came out of a peculiar abnormal relationship between the united states and the soviet union it really is the case that almost everything else was a zero-sum game we had very little with which to cooperate with the soviet union that is not true with russia russia is not a strategic adversary of the united states we're not enemies so the process can look different we're cooperating in the balkans 
we're cooperating on Nagorno-Karabakh. That would have been absolutely inconceivable with the Soviet Union. So I think we're looking to a different kind of security relationship. Let's talk about China for a moment. The United States uh, believes that the Chinese are still selling missiles to countries like Pakistan. You've tried to tell them to stop, that they're in violation uh, of some treaties. How are we going to hold them accountable for these sales? The first step is to get into a forum where we can actually talk about the violations that we see. And Secretary Powell managed to reestablish with the Chinese the need for expert level talks so that we can actually discuss the cases, discuss the problems that we see. Ultimately, if China is transferring uh, weapons of mass destruction and the means to deliver them to countries that are not responsible or to uh, countries that are security risks, I think that uh, we're not going to have the kind of U.S.-China relationship that everybody would like to have. We have a stake in the tremendous transformation that is going on in the Chinese economy. That's why we want to have trade with China, why we want them in the WTO. But we all have also have a tremendous stake in China playing a responsible part in international politics. But isn't it true that there's not a lot you can actually do? I think that for China, which is trying to realize its potential in the international system, a good relationship with the United States is crucial to doing that. And there will not be the full development of the potential in U.S.-China relations if China uh, continues to, to behave in this way. No one needs to spell out uh, what means one might take under certain circumstances. The Chinese understand that we have very serious concerns about proliferation. I think that's why they've agreed to begin expert level talks. I think we can do this in a cooperative way because China should also have no interest in having the spread of these technologies into unstable places. I think we have a basis for a good discussion here and we ought to get about it. Ms. Rice, the uh, New York Times in an editorial this morning makes the point that the United States just seems to be either withdrawing or showing no interest in any number of treaties that have been negotiated uh, in recent years. The Kyoto Treaty, the ABM Treaty, uh, watering down the UN agreement to resolve illegal trafficking in drugs, the non-proliferation treaty. Are you concerned that this is going to leave the United States looking as if it is somehow contemptuous of the work uh, that has gone before and that we are somehow some sort of a isolationist country now uh, that's willing to go it alone no matter what the other countries of the world think? Well, you will not find a more internationalist administration than this administration. We've been engaged with our partners in the Western Hemisphere. We're engaged with the Europeans in uh, the Balkans. We are engaged with the Russians in trying to come to a new framework framework for security, which is much needed in the world. But if internationalism somehow becomes defined as signing on to bad treaties, just to say that you've signed a treaty, that's not going to be sustainable with the American people. The President of the United States was not elected to sign treaties that are not in America's interest, that are uh, not going to deal with the problems with which, uh, to which they purport to deal. And so what we would like to do is to, on these very important problems, and we share concerns about all of these problems, to put forth new ideas, to work with our allies and friends on things that both will uh, support U.S. interests and that can deal with the problem. Some of these treaties were not even supported by the Clinton administration. It was a rather peculiar thing to sign the uh, treaty on the uh, International Criminal Court, but to say forthrightly you could never submit it to Congress because it would not be ratified. The administration, the Bush administration, has taken a different tack, which is that we're going to be honest with our allies about which treaties are in our interest and are dealing with the problems with which they purport to deal. And those that are not, we're not prepared to be party to. But do you worry that perhaps we're creating the impression that we simply want to go it alone? I think if you are in these meetings with President Bush and his counterparts around the world, they understand that we believe that we can be a good partner for our allies and friends. And indeed, even with uh, the Russians, where we're trying to forge a new relationship, we're talking about things that are really important to our interest and to Russian national interest. This is going to be an engaged internationalist administration, but it will not be an administration that signs on to treaties that are not in America's interest. Quick final endorsement. Very quickly, did uh, Colin Powell pledge to the Chinese that the United States is not going to share missile defense with Taiwan? 
Colin Powell had a general discussion with the Chinese of the same kind uh, that we have had with uh, numerous states around the world, explaining the concept, talking about why we need to move forward, and saying that we did not see this as a threat, as a threat to China. Anyone who does not wish to blackmail the United States should not see missile defense as a threat to them. And we believe that the Chinese do not want to blackmail us, therefore they should not see this as a threat. We will intensify our discussions, but President Bush has made very clear that our commitments to Taiwan under the Taiwan Relations Act remain unchanged. In fact, uh, he takes them very seriously, even as we look for a very good relationship with so China. So is that a yes or a no? With China, the, I think we've been very clear. We have obligations under the Taiwan Relations Act to help Taiwan defend itself. Uh, much depends on what the Chinese do in the region. China must adopt uh, a strategy in the region that is not threatening to the interests of the United States or to other states in the region. Condoleezza Rice, thank you so much for joining us. Thank when you. we come back, we're going to turn to that other story, the missing intern, in just a minute. This portion of Face the Nation is sponsored by AXA Advisors. At AXA, we're building futures. And by the document company, Xerox. People put off till tomorrow the things they should do today. It's easy, right? Anthony Padilla, AXA Advisors. Especially when it comes to a financial plan. I work with a lot of people my age. They say, Anthony, I'm young. What's the rush? AXA Advisors is one-on-one -on -one financial help. I say, start now. Sure, you've got a lot of expenses, but you've got this huge advantage, too, and that's time. Hey, I know it isn't easy, but my job is to get you started. AXA Advisors, building futures. How fast can you make brilliant color prints in your office? With a Xerox Phaser 2135 color printer, you can make 21 color prints per minute. That's more than three times faster than HP's fastest color laser printer. Hey, catch us if you can. The Phaser 2135, one of the family of Xerox network printers. This is when a lot of people start to worry. Are they ahead or behind in the race for college, retirement? Mike Jarvis, AXA Advisors. Will they have enough to do the things they want? I tell my clients a good plan can get them through, and it's never too late to get started. AXA Advisors is one-on-one -on -one financial help. Okay, so you're a little behind. You can catch up. I can show you how. AXA Advisors, building futures. And we turn now to that story that just won't go away, the story of the uh, missing intern, Chandra Levy, joining us this morning, the District of Columbia Chief of Police, Charles Ramsey. Chief, thanks very much for uh, joining us this morning. Thank you. Chief, are you satisfied uh, that Gary Condit has an alibi on the day that Chandra Levy supposedly disappeared? And I guess that's the day when there was so much uh, traffic on her personal computer. Well, what we're in the process of doing now is verifying all the information that we've gotten to date, not only from the congressman, but from others that we've uh, spoken with to make sure that we can account for everyone's activities on that day. Did she, in fact, uh, talk uh, to somebody, perhaps Condit's wife, on that day? We have nothing that will confirm that. I'm aware of that uh, story floating around, but unfortunately there has been a lot of uh, information floating around that we simply have no knowledge of. And Chief, let me ask you this, because this is a question that so many people have asked me. Are you satisfied that the computer traffic uh, on her computer that day, how do you know it was her? Could it have been someone else? Well, I mean, obviously it could be, but we doubt it because of the nature of the traffic. We've been able to go back, not just that date, but a couple of months. And what we found is a regular pattern of sites that she visited and things of that nature. So there, there, there's no reason for us to believe there was anyone other than her on the computer that morning. There's a tremendous amount of uh, manpower that you've been devoting to this case. My understanding is you may cut back some of that in the coming week. Is that so? Well, what it is, we've got some of our recruits from the academy helping with the search of Rock Creek Park. They should complete that by the end of this week. They'll be going back to the academy to resume their training. As far as the investigators go, the two lead detectives from our second district 
are the ones that have been involved and they're working with the FBI uh, task force. Uh, they'll continue on this case. Now, do you plan to cut back uh, the other personnel that are working on the case, or will you continue at the same level you are now? Well, actually, other personnel have been used on an as-needed basis for canvassing and things of that nature. Uh, and as long as we have leads to pursue, we'll continue to pursue it. But it certainly there is a perception that we're using far more resources than we have been using. And in fact, that's begun to raise a lot of uh, criticism in some communities that we're ignoring other cases, but that's simply not true. Well, you bring up uh, as leads develop. Let me just ask you candidly, do you have any leads now? Because to many, it appears you've run out of leads. Well, we've got leads that continue to come in uh, through email, phone calls, and so forth. Unfortunately, uh, they haven't really led us anywhere. Uh, some have, have been uh, fruitful, but not very many. So we're no closer in finding out what happened to Chandra Levy today than we were when we first started this investigation. But there's a lot of information and material that we do have that we're combing through. Uh, all last week, there were news stories involving uh, various aides in Congressman Condit's office. In one case, we were told that an aide had advised one of his uh, former uh, female companions not to talk about it. Uh, have those aides been cooperative with your police officers? Well, first of all, we can't confirm any of that kind of information. We've spoken with uh, uh, staffers. There may be a need to speak uh, again with uh, certain individuals, uh, not just staffers, but other people that we've been looking at that have absolutely nothing to do with the congressman. Uh, and that's just part of the uh, investigation. Again, our job is to gather information, then verify it, and then we'll determine whether or not people have been completely truthful with us. Well, you clearly were not satisfied with the uh, lie detector test that his lawyer says was administered to Congressman Condit. Would you still like for the congressman to take a lie detector test? Well, if that's an issue, that add, if that's something that adds value to this investigation, certainly uh, we'll take a look at that. But we need to go through what we uh, learned during a fourth interview now and then see where we go uh, from there. I'm not aware of any immediate plans to move forward with a polygraph uh, examination, however. Now, his brother, who at one time was, uh, uh, had been charged with something or other and, and was arrested, do you have any indication or any plan to, to talk to him about this case? No. Again, uh, you know, obviously uh, the timing is everything, and certainly his problems uh, have been given a lot of attention and publicity. However, we have absolutely no indication at all that he had anything to do with uh, the disappearance of Chandra Levy. We have nothing right now that really points toward anyone having anything to do with her disappearance. Do you still uh, consider this uh, a missing persons case? Or are you anywhere close to calling this a criminal investigation? The only thing we know we have is a missing person, and we're going to continue to conduct this uh, investigation accordingly. However, uh, there's not much more we could do even if we did have it classified as a criminal investigation. But we need facts, we need evidence, we need something before we move in that direction. Chief Ramsey, thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Thank you. And we're joined now by two reporters who have been covering this case, Tom Squatteri of USA Today and Michael Doyle of the Modesto Bee. Michael, um, criminal elements, investigation, all of that beside the point, it is appearing now that uh, the career of Gary Condit, as far as a politician, in my view, is pretty much over. Well, I'm not sure that that's the case, and it's, we certainly don't know that that's the case in the congressman's own mind. I think we have to look at what's happening in Washington and what's happening in Sacramento. In Washington, there are at least five members who've called for his resignation, and a chief ally, Charlie Stenholm, who has denounced his actions. In Sacramento, the Democrats are now redistricting, and what happens in those two places and in Mr. Condit's uh, district will, will be shaping over the next month or so, I would say, his future. So I don't think that we can say that his future is over. Well, but isn't this, isn't there now all of this uh, scrutiny on his office and the operations in his office? Aren't there a lot of things now coming to light that might otherwise have not come to light? I think that is one byproduct that when one thread is pulled, other threads uh, start coming out and there is a certain unraveling. We reported yesterday about um, charges uh, related to uh, campaign spending not done by any Condit employee, but it was a byproduct of the search into Chandra Levy. And certainly there have been other stories about the congressman's raising questions about the behavior. And so that is one threat to his political careers if those stories will be continuing. Tom, you've been looking into the FBI profiling of Chandra Levy. This is something they do when they try to get into her mind, what mindset she was in when she disappeared. What has the FBI learned about, about Chandra? Well, clearly what they have learned is that the woman who came here last fall 
is not the woman who disappeared in April or May, that uh, a security conscious person obsessed with security, somehow that lowered her threshold on where, what she had to do every day, whether she was really caring about security. For example, uh, Gloria, you know, missing interns may not tell tales, but former mistresses and angry relatives do. And from these people, the relatives of Chandra Levy and the other women who have alleged similar relationship with Congressman Condit, the law enforcement authorities are able to f paint a pattern of the sort of cult-like mentality that uh, Chandra Levy may have been caught up in. What do you mean by that? Go well, on. you know, every, we have reported and others have about the rules that Congressman Khan had opposed on her behavior, both entering the apartment, who not to talk to. And one of the key ones is you withdraw from your relatives for the most part and your friends. If you look at comments by Chandra Levy's friends, they were concerned about her not opening up to them like she used to when she came to Washington. That's a sign of withdrawal and that means you're not always on your game. But you use it. It's kind of interesting to me this you're, you're comparing this to some sort of cult because in a sense, and I would ask uh, what you think about this, Mike, you also see some of that sort of developing in this office where you have these mm -hmm. loyal aides. It now turns out that the aides are dating some of the same women that Congressman Condit is dating. Uh, what about that, Mike? Well, uh, the cult is, is a term for it. Um, another term is loyalty, and uh, the congressman actually has had, in some respects, an awfully loyal staff. Six of his 16 employees now have been with him for more than a decade. Some of them are now being uh, questioned or about to be by investigators. So as to whether it's a cult, maybe one way to look at it, another is simply these are people who have worked with a congressman a long time and trust them. Uh, are, are Democrats or Republicans, uh, do, is there any movement out there in the district now of people that are going to run against him? Right now there's a city councilman, who, uh, Bill Conrad, who ran against him in 1996 and was thrashed soundly. There's a state senator uh, Dick Monteith, who has so far said that he uh, would run if there were an open seat, but uh, the Republicans are, are holding their fire right now, waiting to see what unfolds. Tom, hasn't this loyalty question really led to now uh, questions about obstruction of justice charges against some of these loyal aides? Absolutely. I mean, what's being looked at in the aftermath, as Mike said, is, is whether these aides lied about Congressman Condit's uh, behavior and uh, where he was at certain times, for example, denying that he had a relationship with Chandra Levy, perhaps driving him for this drop-off over in Virginia, this watch case. Uh, that is the peripheral, as Mike said, the other threads are being pulled now, but the loyalty when you're loyal to somebody and do actions that may be improper, they're still improper, whatever your reason for doing them. Gentlemen, we have to stop here. Uh, remembering what the chief said again today, they are no nearer now to finding Chandra Levy than right. they were in the first minutes of this case. Thanks so much to both Pleasure. of you. I'll be back with a final word in just a minute. The pain was awful. I was missing my own party. The pain got so bad I wanted to lie down, but it just got worse. Then I rediscovered a real lifesaver, Extra Strength Bayer Aspirin. Nothing's proven stronger than Extra Strength Bayer on tough pain, not even the leading prescription. It's real relief I can depend on. And my doctor said Original Strength Aspirin can help save your life by protecting your heart. Beautiful. Bayer, take it for pain, take it for life. Our client, MMC, says my ad agency is doing a rotten job. Not enough people know they're a great company, so they may fire us. I'll show them. I'll check the impact of our ads totally at random. Hello? Are you familiar with MMC? Sure. It's the parent of Marsh, the world's number one risk specialist, Putnam Investments and Mercer Consulting. Thank you for that unrehearsed reaction. Tell me, Gerald, how are the children? Marsh and McLennan Companies, 57,000 employees worldwide. Imagine where we'd be if we had a decent ad agency. I'll get this. Oh, no, a platinum card. There's always a catch. Low rates that explode. Hidden fees. Highway robbery. Actually, I have a Capital One platinum card. Oh. Get a new Capital One platinum card with a 9.9% .9 fixed rate that starts low and stays low, plus no balance transfer fees. <laughs> What's in your wallet? All around the world, Siemens provides hospitals and doctors with the tools they need to make the right decisions right away. From diagnostics to patient information to care management, we're doing our part to help people everywhere feel 
better. Spin, spin, spin the globe. It's your turn, spin the globe. Spying for the Soviets and spying on Americans for the FBI at the same time? It happened and you won't believe who did it. Eye on America, Monday on the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather. Finally today, I was looking at what's playing at the movies, and it made me wonder, are people getting tired of people? Think about it. The summer's first big hit was Dr. Doolittle 2, an add-on to the old story about a doctor who can talk to animals, at least the ones who speak English. Next came Cats and Dogs, about a conspiracy of cats who are trying to take over the world, only to be foiled by a secret army of dogs. Then Jurassic Park 3, yet another chapter in that story about dinosaurs, opened last week. And now, what must be the fourth or fifth version of Planet of the Apes, which features this time Charlton Heston as an old monkey with, with mixed feelings about guns, and also includes the first interspecies kiss on the lips between a human and an ape played by Helena Bonham Carter. Hey, I'd kiss an ape if she were Helena Bonham Carter. Anyhow, I have no idea what has caused this trend, but in this age when our sports heroes are so spoiled, our elected officials fail to inspire, and the corporate code for advancement is driven only by the bottom line, it is good that we can look to animals as our role models. They are today's rarity, loving, loyalty, hardworking, and almost never duplicitous. And for the record, I have always admired beagles. Well, that's it for us. We'll see you next week right here on Face the Nation. How fast can you make brilliant color prints in your office? With a Xerox Phaser 2135 color printer, you can make 21 color prints per minute. That's more than three times faster than HP's fastest color laser printer. Hey, catch us if you can. The Phaser 2135, one of the family of Xerox network printers. Are in the no, no, sweet no, no. spot now, baby. Is Give me five. There is no stopping us now. This the sky is, is the limit. Incredible. NASDAQ. They expect the NASDAQ to surge above 6,000. Rather than feel nostalgic for days gone by, a Merrill Lynch financial advisor can help reallocate your portfolio to better navigate today's up and down market. It isn't even close to running out. So while we can't bring back the past, we can make the future something to look forward to. This portion of Face the Nation was sponsored by Merrill Lynch Wealth Management. Advice and personal financial planning to help simplify your life. For news 24 hours a day, cbs.com on the internet and on our interactive partner America Online at keyword CBS News. This broadcast was produced by CBS News, which is solely responsible for the selection of today's guests and topics. It originated in Washington, D.C. Experience you can trust. CBS News. It's all here on The Early Show, a spectacular summer concert series you won't want to miss. Wake up to what's happening on The Early Show on CBS. CSI's William Peterson and Barbara Hershey, The Staircase, CBS Tonight.